Hi, this is State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Rakedahl. Thank you so much for listening in on Washington's ESSA Consolidated Plan. As you know, we have an amazing opportunity in our state to think about student success and accountability in ways we've never thought of before. We're moving past No Child Left Behind. We're focusing on ways our agency can partner with local school districts, parents, and community to support all of our kids. To do that, we're focused on equity. Our accountability plan takes a deep dive using data to help us understand how to improve outcomes for all of our students, every group of them, at every school district level. Thank you so much for listening in. We hope it's informative. Please reach out to us if you have additional questions. Hello. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we are going to move forward now and talk a little bit about Implementation 101 today, moving through the what and the why. We're going to start with a little bit of a deep dive about the why. As everyone knows, in January, our Every Student Succeeds application was approved by the department, and it focuses on the four areas that you see on the screen, pursuing equity through closing achievement gaps and opportunity gaps, the continuous improvement for all schools, obtaining and retaining effective educators, and using a more flexible approach to resources. As we think about the emphasis um, ESSA has on improvement, we need to focus on an improvement mindset. Everyone is in this business of improvement and every school likewise will receive the data around the accountability system in mid-March. This is important because every school in the state has places where they're looking to improve. Every principal, every superintendent knows that there is improvement to be had in schools. And so that likewise, every school will receive data in, Mar in March, mid-March, around their own school improvement. Schools will be identified for, su for support to improve student learning. They are not identified as failing. This is an improvement shift in a place that we need it. Most importantly, moving away from No Child Left Behind into ESSA requires that all schools are in the business of improvement. We also acknowledge that the different needs require different kinds of support. And so the focus in our agency is <clears throat> looking at those different supports and looking at those different requirements out in, in schools and districts around those supports. So as we're shifting our work at the agency, likewise, we know districts will look at uh, the needs and the supports um, as they start to implement ESSA. Also, this change will take some time. Over the next year, you will see some immediate changes in our school improvement office, but over time, you'll see that this is work that um, extends beyond just one office, but across all divisions at OSPI. So as we look to explore new opportunities to innovate in schools, um, please give us feedback as we're doing this um, and how it's impacting your own individual district. The work of the agency, obviously, over time has been around um, work individually with students. But as we move uh, into this new approach with ESSA, it's even more important to analyze the needs of students, the needs of teacher leaders, the needs of you as district and school leaders, and then us uh, at OSPI impacting uh, that change. So we will continue to work closely with the ESDs. We also know many of you as district and school leaders come directly to OSPI um, for guidance or support or grants and resources in order to do your work. So this image on the screen indicates that we know even though sometimes we feel far away from the in immediate impact of students, we know that our work here ultimately impacts them in the long run. This is Deb Kame. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Assessment and Student Information, and I'm going to be walking through the what about the accountability framework. This page is a very high-level verbal overview of the accountability framework, uh, the data that are underneath how Washington schools are being identified for support. ESSA says that states, states must annually meaningfully differentiate schools and specifies some measures that must be included and gives flexibility on other measures. So I'll introduce those measures in a minute. 
Washington's framework in a nutshell is that each measure is mapped from a percentage to a one to 10 score. And what I mean by that is that each measure, let's say mathematics proficiency, has a percentage, say 64%. We will convert or map that to a number between one and 10. So each measure for each school and student group will have a score between one to 10. Th those measure scores are combined to yield an overall index score ranging from one to 10. The measures are weighted. I'll sh show you those weights in a moment and their one to 10 scores are rolled together for an overall score. And then using that ESSA index score, the lowest performing 5% of schools are identified as comprehensive support schools. Schools will be identified for targeted support using the same threshold for specific student groups. This approach emphasizes continuous improvement for all schools and not just whether a school is on or off a list. Opportunity gaps and room for improvement will be visible by individual measure and overall for all schools. This table shows the indicator categories by grade band. One row has check marks for the elementary and middle school indicators, and the other row shows the high school ones. ESSA specifies five areas to be included in the accountability framework. The first four areas were pros prescribed. So academic proficiency in English language arts and math, that's number one. Student growth, which for Washington is student growth percentiles. Uh, this is just in the lower grade level, so elementary and middle school. Third is English learner progress. This measure is based on English language acquisition using the ELPA 21 assessment. It includes only students who are English learners. Four is graduation rate. And the core of the grad rate indicator is the four year adjusted cohort graduation rate. Washington is also incorporating the five, six and seven year rates in a new way. And I'll describe that in a couple of minutes. And fifth, ESSA gave states flexibility in this area, which is called school quality or student success, or SQSS. For Washington, there are three measures for SQSS. One is regular attendance, perhaps more commonly known as the flip side of that, which is chronic absenteeism. So did a student miss more than 10% of school days? For a student enrolled all year, that would be 18 full days of school. Second uh, SQSS measure is ninth graders on track. What percent of ninth graders earned credit or passed each attempted course in ninth grade? And then thirdly, dual credit. And this is a measure of access. What percentage of students in grades nine through 12 participated in a dual credit course within a school year? The dual credit categories that are included are running start, AP, IB, college in the high school, Cambridge, and tech prep or CTE dual credit. So each grade band has four of the five indicator buckets. The lower grades have a growth measure and high school has a graduation instead. And a K-12 school would have all of these measures. So the weights. Here are the weights that are used to combine the individual measures into a total score. Each of the pie charts has four slices corresponding to the indicator buckets on the previous slide. Growth in element, elementary and middle and graduation rate in high school have the largest share, 50%. In the lower grade level, school quality or student success, the attendance measure, is a relatively small percent of the total score, it's 5%. Recall that there are three measures in high school for SQSS, attendance, ninth graders on track and dual credit, and those are 15% combined for the high school. English learner progress is 5%. And that's a relatively small weight, but there is a separate support category specific to schools that are struggling with the progress of English learners. These weights will shift a little bit if a school doesn't have a score for a particular measure. 
the full table of waiting scenarios is available within the approved ESSA plan. So the ESSA index on the lowest performing 5%. So as I mentioned earlier, each measure gets a score between one and 10. Those numbers for each measure have been spread out so that about 10% of schools are assigned each number. That is about 10% of schools get a one for ELA proficiency, about 10% get a two and so on. And then about 10% of high schools get a 10 for graduation, about 10% get a nine, and so on. So each school gets a score for each of their measures, and those are combined to yield an overall index score. Those overall scores, the index scores, are sorted, and that will be used to identify the lowest performing 5% of schools or comprehensive schools. So we set a threshold to identify the lowest performing 5% of schools. And that is called out in the Every Student Succeeds Act. We'll draw a line where, those 5 where there are 5% of schools below it. Let's just say that that threshold is numerically in the low twos, marked by the line on the right side. We will then use that same threshold in the low twos for student groups to identify areas for targeted support. I've described this so far at the school level, but this also carries over for student groups. Each student group will also get measure scores and an overall index score if the group is large enough to be included. The student groups are the seven federal race or ethnic categories, also students with disabilities, English learners, and students who are economically disadvantaged. So there are 10 student groups included in the framework as well as the all students or group. So we have a line marking the threshold for support, and that same line is used for both comprehensive and targeted. So in this hypothetical example, this school has four student groups whose index scores are below the threshold. Although the all students index score is a bit higher, there are some student groups that need more support. And this would be a school that's identified for targeted support. Graduation rate. So the graduation rate indicator has the four year rate as its foundation and for which schools will receive a one to 10 score. Then a school may get extra credit or an additional point or two based on the extended year graduation rates. That extra credit is based on additional percentage of students that graduate in the extended timeframes with five years, six years, or seven years. Schools that graduate the highest percentage of students in the fifth, sixth, and seventh years will move up two points, so get two extra credit points on the one to 10 scale and the next highest schools will move up one point. Most schools will stay at the one to 10 scores that were determined by the four year graduation rate. Timeline. This table shows the time frame for data that are included in the index, as well as the support timeline. It's a three year cycle. The first round of ESSA identification and support is right now in the 17-18 school year, and the data are combining the three prior years of data, 14-15, 15-16, and 16-17. That's the green box in the upper left. So it's three years of combined data. The support plan uh, based on these will be for three subsequent years, so 18-19, 1920, 19, and 2021. And those are the three blue years to the upper right. Three years from now, during the 2021 school year, there will be the next round of identification. And it will be based on three years of data again, this time using data from this current school year and then the next two. Note that at that time, science will be included in addition to ELA and mathematics. Also, uh, other school quality or student success measures will be considered to be included at that time. 
a sample display. So this is uh, what OSPI's website display of ESSA data will look like initially. On, on a single page, it shows quite a bit of information. It shows performance by indicator at the top. And you can see it for all students or you can filter to show the indicators for any particular student group. In the lower half, you can see performance across student groups for any particular indicator or for the index overall. So you can visually scan across indicators at the top or you can scan across student groups on the bottom. So these views will be made available publicly for all schools on March 14th. So whether a school is above or below the line, all schools have room for improvement and room to close opportunity gaps. This is just an illustration of communications that are coming out. Uh, on the left is an infographic that explains the system. And on the right is a, a data sheet or the visualization that will be showing information about the schools, a one page printout by school. And this is two images that are part of the public data posting that will be available. These are actual screenshots. These sample schools are posted right now. Uh, the website address is on the lower part of the screen. And it will give you an idea of how information will be displayed. My name is Tennille Jeffrey Simmons, Assistant Superintendent, System and School Improvement. Now I'm going to walk you through the how of our presentation as it relates to system and school support. What you can see on the slide is a side-by-side -side really highlighting some areas of difference between the system that we are transitioning out of in CLB and the system that we are transitioning towards. The purpose of this slide is just to give you a quick view of some of the measures that are different in this system. You can also see here on the right side of the slide, the emphasis around all students and disaggregated by student population. Again, for the purposes of comparing where we have been and where we're headed, you can see on the left an overview of required action districts, priority and focus, and then uh, following the section that you just had on accountability, the uh, measures that we are using in the ESSA system on the right. Here's a visual of one of the differences between the sh shift in methodology. Again, in CLB on the left, where we were identifying the lowest 10% of schools in priority and focus, and now it's a representation of how the system has changed based on establishing a baseline of performance and then identifying schools that fall below that threshold as either comprehensive or targeted. In the NCLB era, there was really one type of approach that was deployed to support schools that were identified for improvement. The supports were uh, relatively undifferentiated, and you can see moving right on this slide, following the green arrow at the bottom of the slide, that we're now heading towards a more differentiated support model organized by tier where supports are differentiated and then matched to the need. Foundational and self-directed being available uh, for a larger number of schools. And then as we move towards those comprehensive schools, uh, which require most of our uh, support and organization and partnership, they will have access to those foundational and self-directed supports and then additional supports. This slide is a quick view of how we're thinking about our work in system and school improvement, focusing on studying, support, and then serving. So studying what are the supports that are needed, uh, support, what are the supports that we have available based on what we have seen as a need, and then how are we going to deploy those supports in an effective manner. Some examples of steps that the agency is taking in anticipation of fall 1819, as we're partnering with CISL inside of the agency to complete a 
professional learning and technical assistance inventory. We're also working on a comprehensive communication plan uh, to schools and, um, for example, looking to partner differently with superintendents as they plan their communication efforts inside of their school districts. We're also working across the agency to implement a common web presence as a strategy for simplifying the exercise of finding uh, tiered supports on OSPI's website. Examples of what those common web pages uh, may look like can be found on this slide and then again on this slide. I'll spend a little bit more time here because it highlights the common organization on program pages that we are aiming towards. What we're looking for is a strategy that would allow someone from the field uh, to know that irrespective of what program they were looking to gain more information about, that they would be able to use a common strategy for finding that information. So these icons uh, we're looking to have present across the website as a way of simplifying the complex work of resource gathering in the field. Here you can see our notification and support timelines from left to right. Um, the date is on the far left is very close to the recording of this webinar because those um, in advance calls to Comprehensive will be beginning very soon, ideally this week. We're also going to be communicating with schools um, in a, another way in advance of that public release of data the week of March 12th. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, mm -hmm. we're partnering with ESDs to organize a variety of superintendent sessions where we can meet in person with superintendents and collaborate with them around uh, messaging and then also supporting them to make sure that the questions that they may have about their data are answered as they're determining how best to lead in their school systems. Immediately following those sessions, we'll be partnering across the agency to hold a number of statewide Zoom meetings. The target audience for those Zooms will not be superintendents, they will be um, district level administrators or even principals. And so the, the the content of the information being shared in those Zoom meetings will be appropriate and tailored for those audiences. Another view of our notification and support timelines can be found in this table. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the coordination with ESDs that it will be following district notification, but you can see that across the board our strategy is to provide information at the right time to ESDs. So as you are um, contacting your ESD, if your ESD is a partner um, in your daily work, that you're able to know that they're aware of the questions that you are grappling with at the time that you call. Thank you for listening to the information that we've been providing. Uh, this next slide is more information to come, and more information to come includes my name. I'm Gail Pauley, Assistant Superintendent for Special Programs and Federal Accountability. We're working with staff across the agency and many of you in our uh, work to really take a look at the fiscal guidance that will help you in your planning and your support of your schools. We're looking at a new electronic grant system which we believe will really uh, lighten the load on all of us, not just our district folks that have been doing our uh, I grants for many, many years. And many of those I grants were uh, separately done for a federal or state program. We're looking at a way to consolidate many sections of the uh, program uh, requirements and put those into an I grants system. We're also looking at how to revise our consolidated program reviews to include many different component parts of what can be considered monitoring. From the very first start in our conversations with you as districts and what you put into your plan, your consolidated plan, to the implementation and the supports that you provide to the students that you serve through those uh, programs and plans. We're looking at tiered supports, as you heard Tanil speak to earlier. 
What are those supports that could be put into place to help you? And looking at systems that you have been working with for a long time through multi-tiered systems of supports, MTSS, and how you look at the levels of support you provide to schools, to students, and the supports that you provide to teachers and helping them obtain the skills and instructional practices that will help them in work that they do with their children, their students. We also have a component part that runs across all of our federal programs, and that's the inclusion of families, parents, and notification information that we will be providing to you on how you actively engage parents with you in decisions like what goes into the uh, school support plans for comprehensive and targeted schools. The last uh, bullet on this page talks about model communication documents. We've had these in the past. We will continue with many of these, so letters that might need to go to a parent to inform them of uh, the qualifications or their right to ask for the qualifications of their teacher, of their child in a Title I school, and many other different kinds of communications as we go through implementation of ESSA and as we work with you and having you help us identify what those communications need to be. So with that information, we thank you for your attention, and please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. We'd be more than happy to help you think through the parts of the information that was provided to you today.